Now, like I said, out in the field, we would grab a biologist when we got back to the office and talk about small game. Here is Ben Robinson, small game biologist. Mr. Farmer. Went out quail hunting with some guys. I said, you got some pretty good dogs? He said, yeah. I said, you find any wild cubbies? Which is a lot of discussion going on out there. And they said, yeah, we've been finding a few in there. A lot in western Kentucky, a couple in central Kentucky. I said, man, let's do this. So we went to Boyle County, found us a covey of quail, one covey of quail, mm -hmm. shot one bird out of it. And you know what? That's probably not too uncommon. Let's talk about, first of all, everybody knows the problems we have <clears throat> with quail. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Let's, let's talk about what those main reasons are. When I was a kid growing up in the, the 60s and 70s in Mason County, you would hear meadowlark and quail all day long. What happened to bring those numbers down to where they are today? You're going to hear me talk a lot about habitat. You're going to hear a lot of our guys talk about habitat. It truly is a habitat issue. Um, habitat has just changed greatly since the time that we were kids. Um, a, lot of, a lot of changes in, in agriculture. Um, we've got, back in the day, you know, we had a lot of smaller farms. We had grown up fence rows. We had areas that weren't mowed. We had, uh, we didn't have a lot of guys out bush hogging. And today a lot of that's changed. Now we've got bigger scale agriculture, you know, larger row crop. We've got fields where you'll see corn for, for miles and miles. Um, a lot of the little fence rows and grown up shrubby areas have been pushed out and cleaned up. And then the bush hog came along, and a lot of folks, we like to call it recreational mowing syndrome, where they like to get their bush hog out. <laughs> Wait a minute, what is what you call it? Recreational mowing syndrome. I might have some of that. Yeah, I think a lot of people do. You drive down about any back road in, in, uh, in Kentucky, and you're going to see a lot of slicked off ground. You know, people, uh, it used to be, it wasn't a big deal to let your fields grow up and just kind of get woolly. Today, uh, people, their mindsets have really changed. They don't like that grown up shrubby, woolly look. Instead, they just get their bush hog out and start mowing, and it resembles a golf course more than it does, you know, uh, a wildlife area. Not happy areas for our quail. <laughs> right, right. They can't get under that. There's nothing to feed on. The fescue's exactly. there. Exactly. So what are we doing as an agency? What are we doing as concerned bird hunters? You know, it's always the conservationist. It's always the actual sportsman hunter that buys a hunting and fishing license who is concerned about the species and wants to bring them back. Sure. People think the opposite. But it's not the hunters who made the birds go away. Sure. So what are we doing as conservationists, as people who buy hunting and fishing lines? Right. That's a good question. Uh, what are some success stories? I don't want to hear all bad. Tell me some success yeah. stories. Yeah. Well, this year we anticipated going into this hunting season that it would be a pretty good season. Mm -hmm. uh, we had pretty good um, reproductive conditions. Uh, the weather was great throughout the spring and summer. It was relatively mild temperatures. We had a lot of rainfall, which uh, quail-like rainfall. Um, and according to our surveys and according to reports I'm hearing, we, we've had, uh, we had good reproduction and we've had some good hunts. How do you determine that? Tell us, tell us a study. How do you know uh, how your populations are coming back? How, what do your biologists do? We've got a couple of different surveys that we use. Um, one has been going on for 50 plus years. It's called the Rural Mail Carrier Survey, mm -hmm. where we send out survey cards uh, the last week in July to all the mail carriers around the state. And as they drive their route, they actually just they tally the number of quail and the number of rabbits that they see. Um, it's just an index. It, it helps us track trends up and down to see how, how populations are doing. Um, we also do a hunter cooperator survey where we have our, our quail hunters and our small game hunters fill out a, a diary type hunting log throughout the season and uh, they return that to us at the end of the year. So it's two different trends that we can track. Um, and, and both of those um, have, have shown some, some ebbs and flows, but uh, we hope this year when we get our hunter cooperator data back that we're going to see some, an increase in the number of cubbies. Now what have we done over the past 20 years when we saw this decline? What have we done to ensure that uh, maybe, you know, we look, look at the state of Kentucky right now. Turkey, deer, elk. People from outside Kentucky want to be here. We've got it going on. Sure. This was kind of out of, and it's, this seems the simplest thing sometimes from the outside, maybe the hardest to fix. So what has the department done and what are we doing to encourage folks to, to bring the quail back? Yeah, over the years, um, a lot of folks, a lot of viewers are going to remember when we used to actually hand out quail and we would pass them out. And this used to be a quail building. This was, we're sitting, we're sitting right in, a, in a quail brooding house. and. Um, we did that for years. We released hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of, of pen-raised quail around the state, and 
we realized it wasn't working. The populations were still declining, and other states had similar stories. A lot of research has been done on pen-raised quail, uh, shown that they have very low survival. Mm -hmm. they, the ones that do survive, they really they have low reproduction. And the ones that actually reproduce, um, they're, they're very poor parents, you know, so mm -hmm. in the chicks, just there's very low survival. So we found out quickly, well, not quickly, it took us a little while to figure it out, but that uh, pen-raised birds was not the answer, that habitat is the answer, and that's really what we switched to. Um, now we've even, we've refined that, where we're actually, we've created quail focus areas around the state. Um, Such as? We've got Peabody Wildlife Management Area, um, we're working down around Hart County, we've got an area. Shaker Town? Shaker Town in Mercer County uh, is one of our focus areas. Livingston County, Clay Wildlife Management Area, the Bluegrass Army Depot. So we've got several different areas where we're actually focusing our efforts. We're really throwing a lot of resources at them, manpower, um, equipment, trying to improve as much habitat as we can. And man, we're seeing some pretty good success. That's a good thing that. to know. But you know, this is not a Kentucky problem. Sure. Um, as our border states obviously are having the same issues you know it's not uh, Kentucky's problem it's it's a it's a nationwide problem and our other states kind of working together and talking together with absolutely each other. absolutely Bob White the Bob White quail which is what we have here is found in 25 states mm -hmm. uh, all the way over to Texas and Oklahoma up uh, to New Jersey um, and down to Florida all of those states are experiencing declines in their population um, and a lot of it is, well, most all states, is, it's a result of habitat. So we've pulled together, and there's a new initiative with all 25 states called the National Bob White Conservation Initiative, uh, where we're all working as one unit trying to figure out ways to restore the quail populations. And one of the key take-homes from that initiative is really going to be the impact that they can have nationally at the, at the Washington, D.C. level on policy, on wildlife policy you know, farm bill policies, things like that. That's what it's going to take to really get everybody united and get birds back. You know, we see this effort all over the United States in the state of Kentucky, and a lot of people um, don't realize, and a fascinating thing about our television shows, we thank those viewers out there who don't even hunt and fish, but understand that buying a hunting and fishing license adds uh, credence to these things, and people can go out non-game. Mm -hmm. We, we keep track of barn owls and turtles and frogs and all sorts of these things. So, you know, so many people are, are trying to get a discount on this, that, or the other. I hope, I hope folks out there remember, if they buy their hunting and fishing license, they're helping projects like this, not only for hunters, but for non-game and all this sort of thing. Now I'm back off my soapbox. But these projects can't be done without sportsman's funds and, and, and other sources of income out sure, there. Sure, absolutely. It's worth noting, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about habitat and what we need to do. Uh, it's worth noting that it's working out right now. You know, we mentioned Shaker Village is one of our focus areas. Uh, this year on one of their quail hunts there, in three and a half hours, they flushed seven coveys. Uh, Peabody Wildlife Management Area, we opened a new track this year, the Sinclair Unit. It had been closed for two years. We've been doing a lot of habitat work there. Our hunting logs show that hunters put up 100, over 160 coveys of birds down there. Wow. Now, granted, some of those were the same coveys being sure. flushed, but uh, a tremendous success. They're there. Uh, they're there. The birds are there. Um, our Livingston County focus area, uh, that's, that's going to be soon to be one of the first national Bob White conservation initiative focus areas in the whole country. It was a pilot project this year, and so that's a really big deal for Kentucky. Clay Wildlife Management Area, those guys, their populations are increasing. I think they had um, some guys flushing two, three coveys this year, which is really good for up there, so. This thing has to be done on a farm to farm to farm to farm, contiguous acreage type of situation. What would you say to somebody out there watching right now who still wants to keep their dogs, still wants to get on some birds, and lives in, an, is in, in a rural area? What can they do just themselves? Right. Just themselves for one this of, next one coming of the, year. the big things they can do, um, and it, it all depends on your property and the uses of your property. Um, if you've just got a piece of property that you're really not farming intensively, stop mowing. Just put away the, the bush hog and let some areas grow up. And um, you know, I, I recently hunted a farm in Mercer County, a 120 acre farm. It was just an old scrubby grown up property that had, it had come out of production, but they, they hadn't mowed it. And we put up a cubby of birds and over 20 rabbits out of that wow. area. So 
Um, just by not mowing is a, is a big thing. Um, if you've got a smaller property, as a lot of folks do in Kentucky, see if you can pull together with your neighbors and, and see if you can all get on a common, on common ground and, and start managing all of your properties together. Now what happens when you have a hillside? And I know this because I've, I've just, just watched it. And I've bush hogged the whole area off and I let it go. All of a sudden, you got all kinds of stuff popping back up that's there. Yeah, you do, absolutely. What happens? What happens? What comes up? There's a lot of things. You never know really what's in your seed bank, we call it. You know, there's seeds that lay dormant in the ground for many years. And um, a lot of times, just mowing is not the only solution. Sometimes you do have to use some herbicides, things like that, to get rid of the fescue that's there. Mm -hmm. You know, fescue grass, what grows in just about everybody's yard around Kentucky. It grows really thick and dense, and it smothers out a lot of the really beneficial plants. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of times we'll go in, we might mow it, we might use prescribed fire and burn it, and then we'll come back and spray it with a little bit of herbicide to get rid of that, you know, that dense fescue. And then you just see the seed bank come back. You'll get a lot of plants like ragweed and um, a lot of wildflowers, things like that, that quail love. Well, I'll tell you what, we could go on, we could talk for hours about Absolutely. this thing. That's kind of a nice topical viewpoint. Talk to your neighbors. Get out there, let some fence rows grow up. Let some fields grow up. Be a slob farmer. That's right. Yeah, what they that's call right. it. And support your neighbors well, when they do that. Don't come down on them. Yeah. Instead, support them and say good job. Thank you very much. Thank you.